Today's video is brought to you by Babbel. There are lots of reasons you might need to learn a language. Professional, personal, travel, lots and lots of reasons. Now you might think, well, I've already had a crack at that, Simon. I've been using those free apps on the App Store. And to be honest, it hasn't gone brilliantly, Simon. What are you here to tell me? Well, I'm here to tell you that Babbel is a better way. It goes beyond the basics. Indeed, it is the number one language learning app in the world, with 14 different languages currently available. So why is Babbel better, Simon? Why is it so much better than the rest? Well, with Babbel, you can count on people who have actual experience teaching the language, not some machine learning weirdness which churns out useless sentences that you're never gonna use. It's also totally ad-free, so no distractions. You can see right here, there are no adverts at all, which is brilliant. It also focuses on language in real life, teaching you phrases that you'll actually encounter in real life situations. Now this app is just part of it, they've also got a website. I, I have to say, I've only ever used the app. It's all very nicely designed, it's easy to use. So start learning a new language today with Babbel, get six months for 50% off. There is a link below, limited time only. New York City is one of the most important cities in the world. Not only is it the largest city in the United States by population, with 8.4 million residents in the city proper and almost 20 million in the greater metropolitan area, but is also one of the world's premier economic engines, churning out an estimated $2 trillion in 2019. If it were a sovereign nation, it would have the 12th largest GDP in the world. But where did New York City come from? Well, believe it or not, the city did not simply spring into being one day, skyscrapers and all. I don't think anybody was thinking that. <laughs> Nearly 400 years ago, settlers from the Dutch Republic came to the islands of Manhattan and founded a fur trading colony there. Unlike the pilgrims in Plymouth who were seeking religious freedom, or the English settlers in Jamestown who wanted to project English power onto the new world, the Dutch were only interested in trade. For 40 years, they ran a profitable enterprise and in the process, inadvertently laid the foundation for the great city that it would someday become. They called their colony New Amsterdam. Prior to the arrival of the Europeans, the area of present-day New York City was inhabited by the Lenape, also known as the Delaware people. They were farmers, hunters, and also took advantage of their coastal location to produce wampum, beads made from shells, which they traded to other tribes located further inland. The area had previously been visited by European explorers, but none conducted an overly detailed survey of the region. However, in 1609, an English explorer named Henry Hudson arrived in what would be become New York Harbor searching for the fabled Northwest Passage, a supposedly faster trade route to Asia which turned out to exist only in the minds of European merchants and monarchs. Hudson proceeded a hundred miles up the river that was named after him, past the site of present-day Albany before returning. He provided a glowing report of the harbor it found to his employer, the Dutch East India Company, stating that it would be an ideal location for a colony. Fifteen years later, in 1624, settlers first arrived to establish a fur trading colony on Governor's Island. The next year, the settlers constructed a larger settlement, including a defensive fort in Lower Manhattan, calling it New Amsterdam. The Dutch called the island Manahatta, which is derived from the Lenape word Manhattan, which has been translated variously as gathering place, place of many hills, or more colorfully, place of general inebriation. After initially spreading throughout the colony of New Netherlands, which consisted of the Hudson River Valley all the way to where present-day Albany is located, as well as outposts as far south as Delaware and as far east as Connecticut, the threat of Native American raids and other hardships of the wilderness increasingly led to the concentration of settlers in New Amsterdam. In 1626, Governor General Peter Minuit decided to consolidate his position by meeting with a local tribe of Native Americans known as Manhattos and striking a deal with them to 
buy the entire island of Manhattan for them for the value of 60 guilders in trade goods. While a far higher price than the legend that says Minuit bought the island for $24 in glass beads, the modern-day value of the purchase still only comes out at about $1,100, a bargain price when you consider what the island's worth eventually became. For their part, the Native Americans in the area didn't understand that the island had been sold to the Dutch. The concept of any individual owning land was rather alien to their culture. What they believed they had agreed to was that the Dutch had purchased the right to trade on the island, to gather beaver skins and other trade goods, and that the arrangement was temporary and eventually the Dutch would pack up and go home. But of course, that didn't happen. By the time of the American Revolutionary War, 150 years later, the Native Americans had been completely removed from the greater New York area, replaced by increasing numbers of European settlers. On an island that would become famous for large and questionable real estate deals, this was easily the largest and most questionable of them all. For the first 20 years of its existence, New Amsterdam was considered a provincial backwater by the Dutch West India Company. The most powerful and respected merchants made their money in the sugarcane trade in the Caribbean, or the spice trade in Asia, or the sale of slaves from Africa. By contrast, the North American fur trade was considered distinctly second-rate, fit only for smaller merchants. No prominent Dutch citizens really wanted to go to New Amsterdam. As a result, the population of the colony was filled with many non-Dutch-speaking citizens. French, Huguenots, Spanish Protestants fleeing the Inquisition, people from England, Germany, Italy, even as far afield as Russia and Sweden. And although they weren't counted in the census, there were many African slaves brought to the colony against their will. One official reports hearing over a dozen languages being spoken in the streets. And they were a rowdy bunch too. There was reportedly one tavern for every 20 men in the city, and drunkenness was an extremely common phenomenon. It makes sense when you think about it. A bunch of men thousands of miles away from home, stuck in a cramped colony with limited recreational opportunities, it was bound to happen. There were fights in the streets, duels, the occasional arson or murder. The fort was falling into disrepair, and livestock were permitted to roam around the city unchecked. Still, four times a year, trade ships left New Amsterdam loaded with trade goods to return to the Netherlands, and the city continued to serve its primary function as the commercial center of all of New Netherland. No one thought to build a church in New Amsterdam until 1642, nearly 20 years after the settlement was established. Unlike the New England colonies, New Amsterdam was not designed as a center for religious worship away from the crowned heads of Europe. It was purely a business enterprise. And yet, in its own way, it became a center of tolerance towards all people, regardless of faith. The first Jewish settlers in North America came to New Amsterdam in 1654. 350 years later, New York City has one of the highest proportions of Jews anywhere outside of Israel. Catholics and Protestants from all over Europe came to New Amsterdam to live together. It was the first instance of what would later become known as the American melting pot, the ability to take people from all over the world and put them together to forge a new city or nation. New York City still serves this role today. It is one of the most culturally diverse places in the world. By 1647, it was becoming obvious that New Amsterdam and New Netherland as a whole were being mismanaged. The director, Willem Keft, had embarked on a disastrous scheme to force the surrounding Native American tribes to pay tribute to New Netherland, essentially a tax, and when the tribes refused, he sent soldiers to massacre 120 natives, including women and children. This understandably riled up all the tribes in the area against the Dutch, even the ones that had previously been on friendly terms with the colonists, and the resulting series of raids and retaliation became known as Kieft's War, or the Time of the Blood. Fed up, the colonists of New Amsterdam petitioned the West India Company, and their board of directors fired Kieft in 1647. To top things off for the disgraced former governor, the ship that was carrying him back to the Netherlands ran aground and sank off the coast of Wales in September 1647, and Kieft drowned along with 80 other passengers on the doomed ship. Kieft's replacement as Director General of New Netherland was Peter Stuyvesant, one of the most important and colorful figures in the history of the city. Stuyvesant had been thrown out of university at the age 
of 20 after seducing the daughter of his landlord, and he joins the Dutch West India Company soon after, rising through the ranks to become governor of the island of Curacao in the Dutch West Indies in 1642. In 1644, he led an attack on the Spanish-held island of San Martin in the Caribbean and had his leg horrifically mangled by a cannonball, forcing his amputation and replacement with a wooden peg, giving him the nickname Peg Leg Pete. Stuyvesant received orders from his bosses to turn the colony's fortunes around and restore its profitability. When he arrived in 1647, he immediately went to work repairing the damage done by Kieft's war. He encouraged settlements of the area surrounding New Amsterdam to the southeast of Manhattan on Staten Island, on the western tip of Long Island, and the town of Brooklyn was later established. All of these had original Dutch-sounding names that I can't pronounce. To the north of Amsterdam, the village of Harlem was established, and finally to the north of the islands of Manhattan, a wealthy landowner named Jonas Bronk built a prosperous farm and large farmhouse. The area quickly became known as the Bronx, which later evolved into the Bronx with an axe. Many of these surrounding communities in the greater New York area, including Hackensack, Hoboken, Yonkers, Secaucus, can trace their origins to Dutch settlements. Stuyvesant also made changes to the city of New Amsterdam as well. He ordered the widening of the main thoroughfare of the city, known today as Broadway, and had a 12-foot wooden wall built across the northern edge of the city to keep out raids by Native American tribes or by the English. The location where the city wall stood is today known as Wall Street. The city wall contains the expansion of the city limits for quite some time, which directly led to the cramped close quarters of Lower Manhattan in modern-day New York City. The Director General helped to oversee a change in business practice for the colony. Rather than monopolizing trade goods from New Netherlands, the West India Company opened its trade ports to other merchants and charged them a fee. Stuyvesant also transformed New Amsterdam into an important way station from Holland to the New World. Ships that originally intended to travel to the Caribbean colonies instead made the shorter trip to New Netherland, dropped their goods, and picked up goods brought in by other ships who plied the same trade from New Netherland to the Caribbean. This was the start of the infamous triangle trades that brought Africa African slaves to the New World in increasingly larger numbers. During this time, the population of New Amsterdam exploded. It is estimated that the population of the city grew from 270 in 1630 to 2000 in 1655, and by 1664, the population was at 9,000. This population boom, caused by a combination of increased immigration from the economic boom and a series of military campaigns that added territory to New Netherland, including neighboring New Sweden, was again comprised of just as many non-Dutch as Dutch citizens, and many settled permanently in America, becoming the scions of prominent families that would go on to become the nobility of the United States. The most famous immigrant to the colony, although no one knew at this time, was a Dutch man called Klaes von Rosenfeld, who came to New Amsterdam in the 1640s. His son changed the family name to Roosevelt, and they would go on to become one of the most important families in American history, producing two United States presidents in the 20th century. Throughout the 1600s, England and Holland were competitors and enemies. They had the two most powerful navies in the world, and as a result had the two largest trading empires in the world, and they were constantly seeking to undermine each other. The two nations had already fought a war in the 1650s, but the internal turmoil in England caused by the English Civil War and the execution of King Charles I meant that the Dutch were largely unchallenged. With the English Restoration in 1660, however, King Charles II knew that he needed to consolidate his position in the New World if his nation was to truly prosper. The English had established a series of colonies on the American coast, including Virginia, Maryland, and New England, but sandwiched between them was New Netherland, occupying a prime position on Manhattan Island. Charles resolved to take New Netherland for himself. Stuyvesant was worried about this possibility and had repeatedly begged for troops and cannons to defend his colony should the English come after it. But the Dutch Republic was stretched thin, worn down by a long series of European conflicts and with many colonial interests around the world to protect. New Netherland simply wasn't high on the priority list, so no troops came. In 1664, the English made their move. Four English frigates sailed into the harbor of New Amsterdam carrying 450 men and a lot of cannons. They threatened to bombard the city if it refused to surrender. 
Stuyvesant, ever the warrior, stood on the battlements and was prepared to fight it out, until he received a letter signed by the most prominent townspeople that said they would not resist the English. They were merchants, not soldiers. Their town was made of wood, and it wouldn't take long for the English cannons to destroy all of it. And on top of that, they felt no loyalty to the Dutch Republic. They'd be just as happy trading with the English as with the Dutch. Stuyvesant had no choice. On September the 6th, he met with the English commander and surrendered the city. Most of New Netherland quickly followed suit. The English offered free passage back to Holland for anyone who didn't want to stay, but nobody took them up on it. Stuyvesant, unable to bear the shame of returning to Holland, retired to live quietly on his personal estate north of the city, known as the Great Bowery. Eventually, the area became known as Bowery. The English renamed the city, as well as the colony, New York, after King Charles's brother, the Duke of York, who had been granted control of the new territory by the king. The seizure of New Netherland started a second war between the English and the Dutch that lasted from 1665 to 1667. The English initially had the upper hands, but the country was devastated economically, both by the outbreak of the plague and by much of London burning to the ground in 1666 in the Great Fire of London. The Dutch and the English came to the negotiating table, and as part of the peace treaty signed at Breda, the Dutch agreed to give up all claim to New Netherland in exchange for Holland gaining control of Suriname on the South American coast. But this is not the last the Dutch would see of their colony. In 1672, King Charles II, humbled by the outcome of the Second Anglo-Dutch War, formed an alliance with the French king, Louis XIV. The two monarchs resolved to destroy the Dutch Republic once and for all. Initially, they were successful in invading and occupying much of the Netherlands, but the crisis allowed for William III, Prince of Orange, who would eventually become the King of England, to become the leader of the Dutch opposition, and he rallied his countrymen against the invaders, creating the Dutch Waterline, a series of deliberately flooded areas to keep out the French army. Their borders secured, the Dutch went on the offensive. In July 1673, a Dutch squadron suddenly appeared in New York Harbor, attacked and occupied New York City. The Dutch renamed it New Orange, and for the moment, it seemed that they had restored their New Netherland colony after nine years of English rule. But it didn't last long. In November of 1674, the Treaty of Westminster ended the Third Anglo-Dutch War, and the Dutch formally renounced all claim to New Netherland. New Orange reverted back to English rule, and the name was restored to New York, which it has been ever since. The origins of New York City as New Amsterdam had an enormous influence on what the character of the city later became. Not only did many of the familiar place names we associate with New York, including four of the five boroughs, have their origins in the Dutch colony, but their founding of New Amsterdam as a business enterprise meant that New York City has always been a place of commerce first. The multi-ethnic, multicultural nature of New York City also has its origins in New Amsterdam, as the Dutch colony was diverse in a way that other settlements of the period, including Plymouth, Jamestown, and St. Augustine, were not. It's truly amazing that what was once a small settlement on the southern tip of Manhattan Island, put there for the sole reason of collecting furs, would, in the span of less than 400 years, grow to become one of the largest and most important cities in the world. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Also support this channel by supporting our fantastic sponsor Babbel. I'm linking to them below. And thank you for watching.